And before we start discussing podcasts and podcasts and Holocaust trauma and go deeper into the theory of the subject, um, I would like to play you the very reason why I am presenting here today. So um, what we are going to discuss later on, stop being abstract for you. So it, you know, so you understand uh, what actually we're talking about. Um, well done, and I hope that now everyone will be able to hear. Widzieliśmy przez moment. Yeah, tak. Um, the thing is that because of many screens, I cannot click play, and now I can. Okay. So as I said, it's a part, not the whole audio track. It's only seven minutes, uh, but I hope you are going to listen to it attentively and find it interesting. As we speak about the Holocaust, it is important to remember that each experience is unique. Every man and woman has their own story to tell. Yet, these stories belong to the minority that managed to survive, while many of the victims of the Holocaust did not make it through the war. But, do the events that took place eight years ago continue to influence us today? Do the experiences of previous generations play a role in shaping current identities? Does the past echo in the present? I'm your host, Ellie McGlinzer, and this is The Holocaust Three Generations, a podcast that explores the impact of the past in the lives of children and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. In this series, three generations born in different decades describe their relationships with each other, offer their insights about the impact of the Holocaust on their families, and share memories and reflections they have never spoken about in public. Therefore, we need to remember that inviting others into the privacy of thoughts and feelings is a challenging task to uptake. This podcast became possible thanks to the courageous participants and dedicated scholars. Music by the Gassen Trio. I think it's important that people continue to talk about this because the trauma is not over, the suffering is not over, the impact on society is not over. It's going to change. It's already changed. It's going to continue to change. But, you know, having spent so much time in Jewish studies and in Israel, there's so many different stories and there's so many different ways of people doing this and handling this. And I feel like given that I've kind of dedicated my life to this in some ways, like feel like I really need to talk about it because I've noticed that my experience and my way of dealing with it is much different than other people. I also think it's important, like I said, is that there's a connection between especially third generation survivors that we have with each other, not just me as a descendant of a Jewish survivor, but friends in Poland, you, we all inherited the situation and whatever role our grandparents played, we still all inherited the same mess. Sometimes in post-war homes of Holocaust survivors, anger and profound grief were dominant. The images and stories about the Holocaust were heavily present in the daily lives of such families and resulted in various behavioral patterns among its members such as overprotection, irritability, and even rejection. Among the succeeding generations, this often led to having to deal with insecurities about their own competence and feelings of being alienated from their peers. My name's Betty Yeager by marriage. My maiden name is Betty Pilipovja. It's P-I-L-I-P-A-U-C-E-A-N-U. Many, 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 many times I felt guilty for surviving. I really thought to myself, why God picked me to survive? But when I look at my family, at my grandchildren, I know why I survive. 
My name is Molly Jaeger Hoffaker. Jaeger was my maiden name. I was born on December 18th, 1949 in Tel Aviv, Israel at the Hadassah Hospital that was there at the time. Hi, my name is Jess Hooks and Betty Jaeger was my grandmother. My mom, who also is a Holocaust survivor, she was from Romania and was deported with her family to Transnistria. And my father, unfortunately, ended up in Auschwitz. He was from Czechoslovakia. That was 19, the, the spring of 1941. I mean, talks and rumors and already worries and things like that started that way before. People used to get into circles in the middle of the city and I used to come home from school and I used to hear that one Jew was taken last night and the next Jew was taken out and this, and this was taken because of that and people were arguing, but we didn't know really what was going on until just about in the spring of 1941. Then a terrible thing happened. I came home and my mother was sitting and she was sewing yellow ribbon into black patches and crying and crying. And I said, Mom, why are you crying? What are you doing? She says, an order came. Brahms announced today that from tomorrow on, we need to wear the, the yellow patches with the yellow ribbon. So I turned around to my mother. I mean, I was only nine years old, but I turned around to my mother and I said, so what if we have to wear? I'm proud to wear the Star of David. That's my star. I said, Gentile people wear that cross with pride. I'm going to wear that yellow star with pride. My mother hugged me and kissed me and she says, you're too smart. But that's not why they want you to wear it, to be proud of it. They want you to be ashamed that you're a Jew. I said, never, mom. God put me in this sort as a Jew, and that's what I am, and that's, I'm going to wear that yellow star with pride. And I did. But my life was reduced then to nothing. I mean, that was my actually beginning of another life. We always talked about it. The girls always knew about it because we were raised with the idea of never forgetting. Never forget what happened. Never let anything like that happen again. Don't let anybody put you down. Stand up, but also learn to keep quiet. I'm sure that they would have murdered me the minute I set foot anywhere near a German because I would have like stuck my chest out at him and started yelling, you know, and that would have been the end of me. I always felt that way, that I, I would not have survived. All right, so that was the part I really wanted you um, to hear. And I would like to proceed with the presentation. Just allow me a moment to turn it on. Right. Um, so what you've heard now uh, is a part of a podcast, The Holocaust Three Generations, that we released uh, in April 2022 on Yom HaShoah or Israeli Holocaust Remembrance Day. It was result of one year uh, meticulous work that started as my school assignment at the University of Haifa. In fact, it was a curatorial class we were, where we were given an assignment uh, to create a commemoration project uh, and we were given all possible means and freedoms required for its accomplishment. So from the beginning, I knew that I would like uh, to work with offsprings of Holocaust survivors and their experience of being raised in such families, rather than keep focus solely on survivors. Uh, but for me, in my mind, it was impossible to separate one from another. So survivors and their offspring had to be together in one project. And a lot of questions uh, were you know, appeared in front of me, um, how to make it happen, how to bring survivors, many of whom are long gone, or those who are still with us are rarely capable of uh, taking part in such projects and how to bring them together with their children and grandchildren together with a little of investment 
um, of money, or better to say, none <laughs> of investment. And the result of such inquiries was an audio track uh, with parts of the interview from Zelig Berghut, a Holocaust survivor, who gave his testimony in early 1990s. And unfortunately, he passed a week, uh, passed before, uh, passed away just a week uh, before I began the project. So his reflections from videotape uh, done by the U.S. Yeshua Foundation were then mixed with part of the interviews that I conducted with his daughter and granddaughter who resided in Australia and in Israel, respectively. The audio was delivered to the family on Yom HaShoah, and in its essence, it was commemoration of uh, Zelik's life. But also it was very intimate and sometimes painful conversation with his descendants, who shared private anecdotes and their personal thoughts about growing with a Holocaust survivor as a father and a grandfather. So while making this assignment, I realized that it had way more potential than it seemed at first. And with time in cooperation with Weiss Levnat Holocaust Research Center and U.S. Yeshua Foundation, we developed five episode series that tell stories of how Holocaust impacted the lives of survivors and their offspring. It was an imitation of multi-generational talk, which is important to underline. It's not a real conversation, but an imitation of it where three generations sit side by side on the, and share their thoughts on the most intimate and often painful parts of their inner beings. However, it was not only meticulous technical job of bringing all the parties together, uh, but also the whole idea of podcast and methods that we used uh, were very well thought through from the academic point of view as we relied at large on scientific literature about intergenerational transmission of Holocaust consequences and methods used in psychology. And here I would like to draw your attention uh, to the wording I'm using. I'm going to repeatedly say intergenerational transmission of Holocaust consequences, not trauma, uh, because those consequences are not always negative per se. Um, so today I would like to share with you some of the results of work that we are preparing for publication together with University of Haifa, Professor Hadas Weisman and Tami Rich. And the presentation is going to address four uh, main parts. First of all, we're going to speak about what is a podcast. And I feel that it's important to spend a few minutes here to uh, underline distinguish, distinguishable features of podcast from radio and uh, showing its unique identity. Second part is we're gonna talk about podcasts about the Holocaust uh, that were increasing in numbers during the last 15 years. And now there is quite a wider range of uh, shows that is offered. And uh, third part is gonna be our methodology. I'm gonna speak how we recorded and produced our podcast, what kind of tools were used and how it was approached from a methodological perspective. And the last part, we are going to speak about statistics, and I hope it's going to shed some light on the opportunities uh, of podcast as a medium for Holocaust research, commemoration, and education. Uh, so what is podcast? While I assume that in one way or another, we all understand the, co the concept of podcasting, it's worth some time explaining it a little bit because there is still... Uh, quite a lot of uncertainties even among scholars on how to define it. So it is both as a delivery system and a medium for primarily primarily audio content. Uh, it doesn't have to be exclusively audio because nowadays there are podcasts that also include video content, but we're going to stick with the um, understanding of it as an audio, um, as a tool for audio content which is always seen uh, within the context of radio and quite frequently dismissed as distinctive or innovative. Media historian Andrew Bottomley in 2015 expressed that much of podcasting newfound creativity is in fact an adaptation of older radio forms, techniques, and styles. However, created in the early 2000s, portable on-demand broadcasting was an innovative distribution system that relied on internet and technical infrastructure of RS feeds. In short, uh, online file, online listeners could receive audio content on their portable devices if they subscribed to a specific RS feed that contained the files. 
Uh, with this development, audio content was automatically delivered to listeners, allowing users to leave their homes uh, with uh, new audio files on their devices without additional effort. And nowadays, it seems something is a given. We all leave our house with our iPhones, and there you can have Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Apple Music. But again, we're talking about early 2000s, uh, and this technology was actually a great technological shift in delivery of audio files. And when you have a shift in delivery system, that shift oftentimes changes the content itself. But changes in form and style were less obvious um, than in technology. So the comparison between radio and podcasting was in many ways uh, inevitable. But with time, podcasting did develop its own style and its own identity. And in their work, Dan and Spinelli identified 11 characteristics of podcasting that distinguish it from radio, as such its intimacy, immersiveness, mobility, listener control, globality, freedom of production, and uh, lack of time constraints. And let's take a deeper look at some of them. So first one is intimacy, which means that um, because we consume podcasts in our earphones or our earbuds, it encourages us to a very interior and intimate mode of listening. This quality is conceptually different from radio listening, which is usually uh, happens through a loudspeaker and facilitates completely different kind of relationship with the listener. Another feature is mobility. And again, when we think about listening music and listening podcasts, we usually consume them on the go. Uh, we move while consuming them, uh, either in urban space, in streets, or other public spaces. And so our body is um, in, in motion when this is happening, when we're listening to podcasts. Uh, podcasts allow listener control, which means that it's extremely easy to replay a podcast or listen to it repeatedly, as well as we can always scroll through the program searching for a particular um, section we need. Podcasts are not um, rooted in the communities, regions, or countries, unlike radio, and this allows them a uh, global audience. Also, there is a freedom of production, as there is no approval needed of an editor or a gatekeeper. A podcast can be made by anyone and any time they want, and it gives a lot of freedom, but it also gives very little support. And another feature out of uh, many that were not said is the lack of time constraints, which means that there is no schedule or no uh, time constraints. The program can be as long as you want it to be, and it can be posted whenever you want. So those are not all features, as I said, but I believe it gives a clear understanding between radio and podcast and how different those two are from one another. And the fact is that independent producers and industry professionals have turned to podcasts into a tool to reach a broader and more engaged audience, covering a variety of topics from comedy to medicine. And following the trend, number of shows with historical themes also grew, creating a space of interaction between academic and public history. Um, but can such complex and emotionally charged topic as the Holocaust be a focus of online broadcasting in the form of a podcast? And in fact, we see that over the last 15 years, individuals and established institutions have produced several different shows ranging from single episodes to entire series. And here I'm gonna present only those shows that are exclusively in English and exclusively focused on the topic of the Shoah. So the first such attempt was done in 2018 by United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. The show titled First Person Conversation with Holocaust Survivors present experts from interviews with victims on the Shoah. Each episode focuses on teams ranging from specific events, location, and people, such as Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, deportation to the Rigo Ghetto, arrival to Auschwitz, and more. Uh, there are overall 48 episodes that feature different interviews with survivors talking about uh, different subjects. Another attempt was done by USHMM as well. In fact, uh, the podcast 12 Years of Shook the World is still ongoing, and uh, there is a schedule already for the third season. So this podcast explores stories of real people, choices they made, and specific moments in Holocaust history from 33 to 1945. 
Episodes also critically approach issues of Holocaust documentation and evidence, use, interpretation, use and interpretation of genocide convention, and role of individuals and their actions uh, through examinations of different rescue stories. Uh, but it's important to note that these two podcasts use Holocaust, uh, ho use recorded testimonies of Holocaust survivors as their base. So another notable work here is those who were there voices from the Holocaust, uh, created with New York Museum of Jewish Heritage Memorial to the Holocaust in collaboration with Fortnoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies at Yale University. And uh, they bring out a great variety of testimonies from their archive, including not only survivors, but also witness and liberators. Uh, but the idea is pretty much similar to those two that I discussed above, where the testimony is the core of the podcast. In 2020, Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center in Jerusalem, also released their show, which is still ongoing. It's titled On the Holocaust. And it is the lecture series that's focused on expertise of Yad Vashem historians and features critical scholars on various topics related to the persecution of Jews in the Second World War. In 2001, the United Nations released their own project titled The Awards Surviving the Holocaust. And unlike those works that I just described above, the United Nations uh, tried to record interviews with those survivors who were still living back then. So living in 2001, offering them a way to preserve their story if this uh, hadn't been done before. So from that, we can conclude that there are two main uh, groups of podcasts that are available as either scholarly discourse, like in case of uh, podcast released by Yad Vashem, or um, we have podcasts that are highlighting voices of survivors themselves. And the only work that doesn't fill within these two categories is We Share the Same Sky, the podcast, created by the UC for Shua Foundation and Rachel Sorori, a granddaughter of Holocaust survivor. Uh, it was released in 2019, and it's a seven-episode um, narrative that tells the story of Rachel's decade-long journey, retracing her grandmother ward history, including visits to the places of her survival. Each episode lasts between 10 and 40 minutes and is beautifully crafted by combining survivor's testimony, uh, which is Rachel's grandmother, and Rachel's own first-person narrative immersed in historical context. So Sorority's work is thus the first podcast to simulate a dialogue between survivor's account and descendant's perspective. The success of the podcast uh, has been widely recognized with half, half posts for instance, listing it as one of the best shows of 2019, and USC Shoah Foundation including, included this uh, podcast as a tool in educational programs such as Eyewitness and Echoes and Reflections. Another work was released just two months ago by European Holocaust Research Infrastructure uh, called For the Living and the Dead, Traces of the Holocaust. In each episode, a Holocaust researcher talks about an object such as teddy bear, postcard, gramophone discs, magazine cover, or typewriter that is telling a unique story of the owners or of itself. And the stories were collected from all over Europe, from Belgium, Ukraine, uh, from Romania and Italy. There are two other recent works. One of them is Holocaust His Stories by Jonathan Bonder which explores stories of Jewish boxers and their resilience and courage during the Second World War. And another one is um, Resistant Resilience and Hope, done by Illinois Holocaust, Illinois Holocaust Museum, which is uh, another type of one-on-one uh, -on -one interview between host and a survivor. So in summary, podcasts about the Holocaust are an evolving phenomena. Uh, and it appears that medium of the podcast has much to offer in terms of Holocaust remembrance, education, and scholarship. Indeed, the major Holocaust institutions have recognized the potential of the medium and have also set out to produce content for global audience uh, over the past decade. Still, the material produced generally focuses on either survival testimonies or expert research. And as far as we knew, only Rachel Sorority has broken this pattern and created a new form of storytelling 
by bringing herself uh, into the story as a granddaughter, highlighting the relationships between generations. In this way, the narrative about Holocaust was transformed uh, from a purely historical event whose repetition must be prevented to a living memory that affects generations born long after it occurred. With this new form as inspiration for podcasting, many questions remain. While psychologists have been fiercely debating for decades whether there are any intergenerational consequences of the Holocaust or not, can the medium of podcasting uniquely contribute to these scholarly discussions and make them accessible to broader audience? If so, then how? In other words, can the unique features of the podcast provide a new perspective on these issues and thus contribute to understanding the long-term consequences of the Holocaust in ways other media such as videotapes or radio cannot. And here we come to another, to the third part of my presentation, which is actually methodology of developing our podcast, The Holocaust for Generations. And uh, as you could understand, we bring together three generations within one family, which is very important, to talk about how their family history of the Holocaust has affected their lives and their relationship with each other. The podcast is based on approach referred in academic literature as psychohistorical. This assumes the prior knowledge of Holocaust background of families is a key to identifying multi-generational process in such units. Therefore, unlike almost all other podcasts dealing with the Holocaust, we do not cover the history and narrative of a single specific generation, which is usually the survivors themselves but we build on the testimonies of the survivors and also introduce their descendants. In the case of our study, all three generations act as the sources of their own experience. They share their subjective perception, which we have no intention of questioning or fact-checking. What they share and how they share, it is what important for us. And it is uh, this uh, thoughts that are later on threaded together in one narrative with three distinct voices complementing each other, creating a simulacrum of a conversation. To examine the story and how it lives on after the survivor is no longer alive, which is becoming more and more common over the times as number of survival is, survivors is decreasing, we tried to mainly focus on families where survivor generation is no longer alive. And why did I say tried? Because there was one exception out of five where we included a family uh, where the survivor was still alive yet for quite some time. She was in a very difficult state in a hospital. Uh, apart from adapting to the reality where numbers of survivors does go down every year, such conditions allow respondents to engage into a deeper introspection of the events and interaction with the survivor outside of parental shadow. Uh, saying, in other words, if there is no survivor present, it becomes easier for children and grandchildren to reflect on their experience of uh, being raised in such families. Since the starting point for the reflection of all three generations is the survivor's story, next criteria was the existence of an interview with a relevant survivor. And it was important for this recording to be accessible. To be as inclusive as possible and to increase chances of finding relevant participants, we focused, uh, the focus was on the content of the interview rather than on the origins of the interview. In other words, as long as the recording uh, was done by any foundation, institution, or family, but as long as it has Holocaust survivor that we're looking for, um, and their own narrative, it didn't matter whether it was done at home, in private foundations, or established institutions. A challenge we faced here was that uh, some recordings were of a very low quality, especially those that were done in 1990s. The technologies were obviously different, and we had to repair the audio uh, in order to make the sound clearer. There is a whole separate lecture on how to make audio renovation, uh, but it's important to keep in mind that such challenges uh, can occur. In addition to above mentioned criteria, uh, the interest of second and third generations of the same family to tell their story and their voluntary participation were also fundamental for us. This include, included their willingness to keep, to keep their names open. 
in order to give personality to the voices and emphasize the relations between the interviewees. Especially it felt important because of the animosity in Holocaust research where victims are frequently, uh, frequently unknown. Since English is the working language, it was decided to proceed with families who were willing to talk about their experience exclusively in English, which was another criterion for selection. In addition, this choice simplified our production by not requiring translation or voiceover of the original recording, uh, which allowed, uh, if, we, if we would try to doubt it or make a voiceover, it, was resu it would result in a complete loss of original features or sonic moments, so to say, such as accent, cries, or whispers. So participants were found through a snowball technique and personal context, and adding to the difficulty of finding volunteers, we tried not to compromise on diversity of the experiences and respondents themselves. First, while we did not overly state uh, that we're looking for specific genders, we did strive for gender balance, resulting in seven males and eight female interviewees ac across all generations. Second, the volunteers were interviewed, the volunteers that were interviewed came from different countries and continents, including the US, UK, Australia, and Israel to ensure geographic diversity. The same principle was applied to Holocaust survivors themselves, including testimonies from Germany, Poland, Hungarian, and Romania, as well as difference in the experience of Holocaust survivors ranging from extermination camps, labor camps, ghettos, flight, and hiding. So it was important to show that uh, there is a range of survival strategies. It was important to order, in order to emphasize the encompassing nature of the term survivor. And furthermore, it was important to include various destinies to avoid generalizations or any kind of generalizations of experiences. Uh, here is a quick outline of the whole process. It started with RAP interview or relationship anecdotes paradigm interviews uh, based on the methods proposed by Wasman and uh, Barber in 2008. And the interview were conducted through online podcast recording platform called Dancaster. Uh, it's also important that the uh, uh, interviews were not done over Zoom because the quality of the recording that would be very low. And due to extreme difficulty of topic and emotional investment of the interviewees, into the story, it was agreed that interviews would uh, the interviews would not exceed the time frame of one and a half hours. So during this one and a half hours, the interviews were asked a series of questions, uh, each in a separate recording session. In addition, the children of Holocaust survivors were interviewed first, uh, followed by the grandchildren, in order to be sensitive to the proximity uh, of the events and see how reaction and reflection reflections change over time. During the interview, we always ask the participants whether they want their cameras on or off, but regardless of their decision, the video was not recorded, only the audio. Respondents were asked questions from six different categories, uh, such as introductions and childhood, intergenerational communication about the Holocaust in the family, remembering the Holocaust, coming to terms with the past, family life, and reflections on the podcast. Prior to each session, we adapt the questions to the interview's family history based on the Holocaust survivor's testimony that we obtained before the interview. And while some questions were designed to elicit a relation, re, relational narrative, other questions guided respondents. And uh, on one hand, this approach was taken because it was believed that respondents should be free to talk about whenever they felt and was, was relevant to the topic of understanding their experience of being child or grandchild of Holocaust survivor. And on the other hand, uh, certain restrictions have to be made because data collected would be later reused in a digital product aimed at an audience unfamiliar with respondents on the topic. Therefore, the questions were focused on the interviewees and their reflections in order to collect systematic data and not just random string of sentences. In addition, at the end of each interview, second and third generations were asked about their motivations in participating in such project and their feeling about giving such an interview. Once data was collected, post-production stage began, 
And that's where we worked with digital audio workstation called Adobe Audition. Uh, this required uh, post-production, required highly attuned, focused, and attentive listening, paying interest to both the content and emotional tone of participants. In other words, the empathic attitude of listening towards the interviews was applied, developed by Dossel-San in 2013. This method of quantitative research suggests that any description of experience always includes facts and the indicators of how to evaluate the meaning of these facts. Based on the above stated approach, uh, the final product was later hosted on a platform called Anchor and streamed into Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, and other platforms. It was also advertised through um, Times of Israel blog space, Instagram, and Facebook. And after it was released, within a few weeks, we were collecting feedback. So based, based on what I was just saying, the final product included five episodes um, of different nature that were distributed. And you can see the survivors that were involved, the testimonies that we used, and the main um, topics that were like a threading line during the whole episode. So for example, chapter one, uh, which talks about generations from Frankfurt to London, the core theme that was running through the whole episode was integration of old wounds into current life and work through difficult family history. So chapter two, uh, we decided to use, not we, uh, the, the survivor in the family, uh, that's how our decision was, uh, but that's what, what our decision was built upon. So we talked about how an upbringing influenced by Holocaust survivor guides people through everyday challenges. Chapter three focused on possible survivors' adaptation strategies and its effects of, on, on the offspring. Chapter four talked about effects of anger and grief of survivors uh, and effects on lives of their offspring. This is exactly the part uh, that we heard at the beginning. It was from the chapter four. And chapter five talks about survivors' silence and challenging task of rediscovering family history by their descendants. And here we're moving to the last part, uh, to the statistics. And I wanted to show who is listening to such content, uh, if they are listening. And we can see that 70% of our audience is female, 24% is male, and plus 3% non-binary and 2% did not specify. When it comes to the age, it's assumed that podcast um, is a medium for a very young audience. However, when we look at our statistics, we see that 26% um, of the audience were above 60 and another 26 in the gap between 45 and 50 plus. And you know, later on, it becomes younger and younger. It's interesting to know that um, the young segment of age between 1922 and 23, 27 is not so present um, and actually, uh, we decided that part of the explanation here can be is that, that they're not ready to face um, to face this topic that openly yet or simply not interested. And here is another interesting slide uh, that shows um, distribution of our podcast. Overall, we have over 700 downloads and unique listeners. So it means over 700 times um, there were unique uh, devices that accessed our product. So for example, if you listen to it five times from one iPhone or um, play different episodes, it's still gonna count as one for us. And um, in the first seven days of the release, we crossed over 100 those unique listeners, which made our podcast entering into 25% of podcasts worldwide. Uh, the main audience comes from the US, UK, Israel, and Australia, which is quite predictable because those are the countries where our interviewees came from. And also uh, those are the countries with the largest Jewish diasporas outside of Israel. But what's interesting are the countries where the percent of listeners were less, but still we managed to cover such places as South Africa, Romania, Estonia, Morocco, Colombia, 
Mexico, Qatar, Singapore, Greece, Ukraine, Chile, New Zealand, Philippines, Georgia, and more, which proves to the absolutely unique and fascinating um, abilities of podcasts to reach wide audience and to reach global audience. Uh, so this is actually what I wanted to say uh, today. And as you can see, I didn't try to figure out how the human mind works or how human psychology works, but I was trying to do today's um, present you a tool, a creative tool of how this topic can be approached, topic of trauma and Holocaust can be approached, how it can be uh, delivered to a wider audience, how it can be studied and consumed. And also it's not only the topic of the Holocaust, where podcasting can be useful. It's also any other topic or any other trauma where interviewing participants uh, and then merging them together in one thread, creating a simulacrum of a conversation can actually give uh, great results. Thank you. If you have any questions, please.